I'm Theodore Miller from Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, and we're going to be talking about radiographic analysis of the prosthetic hip. The outline for this lecture is that we'll talk a little bit about terminology of hip replacements, discuss bearing surfaces and stem designs and what normals look like, and then the various complications that you may encounter radiographically. All of these terms describe different types of hip replacements. In hemiarthroplasty, only the femoral side of the joint is replaced. That's typically done in cases of fracture where the joint itself is still preserved. You don't have degenerative arthritis or, or arthrosis. And so here are two different examples of femoral hemiarthroplasties. This is a monoblock stem, meaning it's one big piece of metal with a head on the, on the stem. And this one is also a, a, a unipolar hemiarthroplasty, um, but it's a modular head meaning that they've picked a head that they can then uh, match with the, uh, with the stem. These are also unipolar hemiarthroplasties. The problem with the unipolar hemiarthroplasty is that you have the metal head directly articulating with the native acetabular cartilage, and it can eventually wear away the cartilage. So here you can see this cartilage space is narrowed, and in this different patient, you can actually see that the metal has now worn away the cartilage completely. You've got metal on bone and degenerative fibrocystic change. So in order to protect the native acetabular cartilage, often what will be done is called a bipolar hemiarthroplasty. It's still a hemiarthroplasty because they're only replacing the femoral side of the joint, but in order to protect the native acetabular cartilage from the femoral head, they'll place a cup in between the femoral head and the, and the native acetabulum. Now, the cup is not fixed into the acetabulum, nor is the acetabulum prepared or reamed in any way, and that's why it's still only a hemiarthroplasty. Because the cup is not fixed into the acetabulum, you can still get motion of the cup against the native uh, acetabular cartilage. And so here in this same patient, you've got an AP and a frog lateral view. Notice the difference in positioning of the cup because it's moving just like the head is moving, and it will also eventually, in a high-demand user, wear away the, the articular cartilage because there is a, a bearing surface at that point as well. Total hip replacements are done in cases where you've got degenerative arthrosis or inflammatory arthritis. So in other words, the joint itself is bad. And so you have to replace both sides of the joint. And these are two different examples of total hip replacements. This is a metal on polyethylene bearing with a cemented femoral component. This is a ceramic on ceramic bearing with a non-cemented femoral component. They're both total hip replacements. We will talk in a few minutes about the different bearings and the different types of stem designs. Hip resurfacings also replace both sides of the joint. They're typically done in younger patients with degenerative arthrosis. And so you can see here on the patient's contralateral left side, they have degenerative joint narrowing in the setting of a cam type configuration of the femoral head with resultant femoral acetabular impingement. These younger patients will live long enough to unfortunately need to, need to have hip revisions. And so you do a hip resurfacing in order to preserve their bone stock so that later on in life they can have a total hip replacement and still have a lot of bone remaining. And so this is what it looks like uh, in a, in a um, non-clinical picture. You can see it's a metal head articulating with a, a metal cup. And notice that there's a single peg in here. So what the surgeon does is basically cuts the head down to size a little bit, whittles it down. The cup is fixed into the acetabulum. The head has been whittled down and reshaped to allow this cup to fit over it, and it's pressed fit in. There is cement that's put in underneath this to act as a grout and to help distribute forces, and it preserves all the femoral neck bone stock as well as the bone stock of the, the uh, femoral shaft itself. And this is the difference between a hip resurfacing and a total hip replacement. You can see here in the hip resurfacing, you've just resurfaced the, the um, bearing surfaces. You've still preserved bone stock, whereas in a total hip replacement, you've actually taken off the femoral neck and the stem is going down into the femoral shaft. So there are different types of bearing surfaces, all with advantages and disadvantages. This is the, the most common type of combination, which is a metal femoral head on a polyethylene bearing. And this is what it looks like cl uh, clinically. The advantage to having metalhead on polyethylene is that it's inexpensive. Um, it's a surface that, that uh, surgeons are used to using. They can use offset liners. It's forgiving in, in positioning. And so this is the most common, common type of bearing. The problem with this is that the polyethylene can get worn away, and the polyethylene fragments then can wind up causing osteolysis, which we'll talk about in a little while. So in order to get away from 
metal on polyethylene with resultant potential osteolysis. Developers have tried using a metal head against a metal acetabular component. So the advantage to that is that you no longer have polyethylene in the equation. And this is what it looks like clinically. But the problem with metal on metal is that you can either get a hypersensitivity reaction to metal ions that are shed, or you can have frank metal wear, which then causes metallosis of the surrounding soft tissues. So a third bearing surface is ceramic on ceramic. And the advantage to that is that you get rid of the metal thermal head and you get rid of the polyethylene or metal acetabular bearing. And so you don't have the risk of polyethylene or metal wear. The problems with ceramic on ceramic are several. Number one, it's very expensive. Number two, it is not as forgiving in positioning. So if it's not in a perfect position, you may get stress loading and the thing may fracture. And that is a problem. Fracture is a catastrophic failure of uh, ceramic on ceramics. And then lastly, uh, ceramic on ceramic may squeak. And that actually can be quite audible to the patient and um, make them actually want to have the, the um, bearing surfaces revised into a more conventional metal on polyethylene surface. Dual mobility cups are something that you should be aware of. These were originally designed in the 1970s to decrease dislocations, and in fact, they do have a lower dislocation rate than a conventional bearing surface. And these are just two examples from the, the internet, from different companies. And you can see that it's called dual mobility because you actually have a femoral head articulating against an inner cup, and then the inner cup articulating with an outer cup. And so here again, head versus cup, but you've also got an articulating surface here as well with the actual acetabular liner. The idea being that if you have um, bearing in two different locations, it will decrease your dislocation rate. It doesn't decrease your wear rate, but it does decrease the dislocations. And these are two different examples uh, from my uh, uh, caseload of what these things look like. They often have this almost seagull-like appearance of the acetabular component, and that's how you know that they're dual mobility. Now, you can also constrain a dual mobility bearing. And so here in this diagram taken from the literature, you can see that you have the femoral head articulating with an inner cup. That inner cup is locked into an outer cup by this locking ring. And this is what it looks like in one of my cases. So you can see that here's the neck, here is the head, here is the inner cup, and it's locked in to the outer cup. And so you have articulation across two different bearing surfaces, and they're locked into each other, all of which should hopefully decrease the rate of dislocation. All right, so now we've talked about different bearing surfaces. There are also different types of stem designs and different ways of, of putting the stems in. So same patient with two different types of stems. These are both um, metal on polyethylene bearings, but this stem is cemented and this stem is non-cemented. So cement fixation was the traditional fixation technique back when, when uh, hip arthroplasty was being devised by John Charnley in the 1960s, and he cemented his, his prostheses into place. What you have to realize is cement is not an adhesive. It's not sticky. It actually is a grout. And that grout is simply meant to form a bond between the native femoral stem and the prosthesis to help it share the load and provide uniform stress distribution. Today, cement is typically used with stems in elderly patients. So these are three different classifications of the medullary canal. This would be a nice young person with, with nice thick cortices. This would be an older patient who's now a little bit osteopenic and you can see the cortices are thinner. This is the type of person in whom we want to put in a cemented femoral stem because they may not have enough good bone stock to actually have ingrowth onto a non-cemented type of stem. There are a couple different stem designs that you see with, with um, cement. Um, one is called the composite beam, and these typically have a collar along the medial aspect of the, the proximal uh, femur. And this helps prevent subsidence, and it also helps to act as a guide for placing the prosthesis in. You can see both of these are cemented. The composite beam is irregularly shaped, so it is driven into the cement column, and the cement forms this bond around it and therefore acts to compositely, in a sense, distribute the forces as the patient walks. Instead, the loaded taper does not have that collar. It's, it's loaded and tapered in two different dimensions um, and forms a wedge that's then put into the cement. And as the patient walks, 
it subsides a little bit, but forms this wedge and gets wedged into the cement, which then eventually again forms this type of bond, which helps to distribute the stress. Notice also this little lucency here. This is a, um, a guide that's on the tip of the stem that helps the, the surgeon put it in correctly. Similarly, this is a cement restrictor, which helps the cement stay where the surgeon wants it so that when they put this composite beam type of prosthesis in, the cement doesn't shove all the way down the, the femoral stem. You want to maintain pressure in here in order to form a nice bond between the cement and the endosteal surfaces, as well as between the cement and the prosthesis. So non-cemented stems were developed in the 1980s primarily because they thought that cement was causing osteolysis. We'll talk about that in a moment. So non-cemented stems rely on their stem geometry of being wedged in order for initial fixation and stability to take place. When we talk about stem stability, we're talking about axial stability, meaning we don't want the stem pistoning up and down in the shaft. And we're talking about rotational stability, meaning that we don't want the stem to twist in the femoral shaft. You're also relying on their geometry for eventual bone ingrowth in order to fix the, the prosthesis into the bone. So you need good bone stock in order to have a, um, a non-cemented prosthesis. And this is what we're talking about with bony ingrowth. Here's a patient at time zero, and here's the same patient several years later. You can now see the sclerosis around this area of, of um, centered surface of the proximal aspect of the stem, and you can see the bony ingrowth that's forming this, this connection between the endosteal surface and the prosthesis to help fix it in place. Here's a different patient over the course of four years, the same thing. You can see here initially there's no bone ingrowth, and now four years later there is bony ingrowth onto the surface of this proximal aspect, the metaphyseal portion of this prosthesis. Notice also that there's a slot in the distal aspect of this femoral stem, and here in the same patient in a slightly different projection, you can actually see now what are called splines. And this is very important because what happens with a prosthesis is if it's too stiff, you can wind up causing thigh pain in the patient. And so some of these stem designs have this slot to decrease the stiffness of the prosthesis. They'll also have these splines, which are ridges and flutes, which are grooves. It also decreases the stiffness of the distal prosthesis and also provides some rotational stability to the prosthesis. And so here's a diagram taken from the literature. You can see the different types of, of wedge configurations of these non-cemented prostheses. Um, but I really want to just draw your attention to basically four different types. There's this group up here. There is a modular type of prosthesis, which gives the surgeon the ability to dial in different types of acetabular versions in case the patient needs some sort of uh, anatomic correction. There's the anatomic prosthesis, which is typically shorter than these, anywhere between 135 millimeters or 120 millimeters. Notice that it's also curved in an AP direction, so it's supposed to be more anatomically matched to the actual shape of the proximal femur. And these are typically used in the anterior approach, or the so-called minimally invasive type of, of hip replacement. The last type of stem design is this cylindrical, fully coated design. Surgeons don't like to use the cylindrical, fully coated design initially for two reasons. Number one, when you have a cylindrical stem, it's very stiff, and so the patient will get thigh pain. And if it's fully coated, what happens is you wind up getting stress shielding. In other words, it takes all the pressure off the proximal aspect of the bone, and you wind up getting osteopenia. So instead, these are typically used in cases of revision where the patient may not have good bone stock proximally anyway. So they will then use the fully coated cylindrical type of, of prosthesis. Notice here in this modular design, you've got the splines and the flutes, and you've got this slot, and we'll see some radiographic examples in a second. So this is, again, taken from the literature. Again, the splines are ridges, the flutes are grooves, and you can see that very nicely here on an EOS image from one of my cases. Notice that this is a modular type of femoral stem. It allows the surgeon to create um, different, um, uh, different uh, femoral versions, but you can see the splines and the flutes very nicely here. This is a different patient. Again, you can appreciate both the splines and flutes as well as the slot. Some people have called this a closed pin design, but the whole idea between both of these is simply to decrease the stiffness of the stem and thereby decrease the, the uh, possibility of thigh pain. And here's a close up. You can again see the splines and the flutes. And again, here's the slot. So this is an example of the anatomic short stem. 
Again, you can see the metaphyseal region where you have the ingrowth that will take place, but notice that it's curved, and notice that it's curved in the AP plane as well, matching the, the shape of the proximal femur. This is an example of a cylindrical fully coated stem. Two different examples. Here, notice that the centered surface goes all the way down. Here again, notice that the surface goes all the way down and that these are not fluted. They're, there's no slots in here. These are done for cases of revision. Now, what you may see, both with a standard stem and, and with a shorter stem, is cortical stress remodeling. And so what happens is this is just a normal response to the different pressure that is now exerted on the cortex. It'll sometimes be uh, lateral, it'll sometimes be medial, as in this case. Um, it may be fusiform, but it's just a benign cortical reaction and hypertrophy of the bone to the new stress that it's seeing with, with the prosthesis in place. Sometimes when patients lose complete bone stock or it's a case of a tumor and they have to resect a big piece of the bone, you'll see something like this. This is called a femoral replacing total hip replacement. This patient has no more bone stock, again, either because of osteolysis or because of tumor that needed to be resected. They've put a bipolar constrained dual mobility type of, of um, prosthesis in here, but the idea being that this has replaced any proximal bone that, that would have been there. So now let's talk about other normal appearances. So when we're talking about the stem, if it's cemented, we don't want to see any lucency either at the cement bone or, or um, cement metal interface. If there is a lucency, we want it to be thin, less than two millimeters. We don't want any lucencies in a non-cemented between the prosthesis and the, and the uh, host bone. We also want the stem to be either in neutral position, meaning straight down the shaft, or in a mild valgus position, meaning that it's going to be against the, the medial side of the, of the cortex. We don't want the stem to be in varus. Varus positioning would mean that the stem is now against the lateral cortex. And the reason you don't want it to be in varus position is because of the risk of loosening and femur fracture. When we talk about the acetabulum, you want the head to be sitting either symmetrically in the cup or maybe even slightly uh, inferiorly, if the, if the uh, surgeon is using an offset polyethylene liner that's a little thicker superiorly, that's okay to see the head then slightly inferior in the prosthesis. We want the acetabular component to have about a 30 to 45 degree of inclination measured from the vertical. And we want it to have about 20 degrees of antiversion, meaning that it's opening toward the front of the patient. You will sometimes see what are called cement restrictors. I showed you one a few minutes ago. This one happens to be completely lucent. And again, the idea behind this is that it prevents the cement from being pushed down the shaft as the surgeon is wedging his stem into that cement column. Sometimes if they have to cement the acetabular component, and they don't really cement acetabular components anymore, but you'll still sometimes see this if they've perforated the medial wall of the acetabulum. Again, they'll put this little mesh in there to, to restrict the cement from pouring into the pelvis. All right, so that brings us now to the second half of the talk, which is going to be complications, and we'll discuss all of these different types of things that you'll see radiographically. Dislocations, when they occur early, are typically due to tissue laxity. In other words, it's in the immediate post-op uh, period, several months or so, uh, where the tissues have not yet um, stiffened up and, and are holding the prosthesis in place. If it's late, it's typically due to poor acetabular placement, either something that's too excessively inclined or too antiverted or retroverted, meaning opening toward the back. The components may be, may be mismatched, meaning that, for example, you have a very large acetabular cup and a very small femoral head. In a very simple way, you can think about the head as, in a sense, rattling around. That's not exactly how it works, but that's how I can think of it. Or trauma, where you just have enough of a force that it knocks the, the, the head out of the cup. So here's an example of an early dislocation. This is the immediate postoperative study in November, and several weeks later, the patient is dislocated simply because their soft tissue envelope has not stiffened up yet enough to hold the prosthesis in place. But this is a late dislocation in a different patient, and you can see the reason that they dislocated is that the acetabular component is too vertically inclined. This is a different patient who actually has a bipolar hemiarthroplasty. So this cup was never cemented or fixed. And again, with enough force, that can come out. Or with enough force, even a patient who has a 
dual mobility constrained liner, which was placed in because they're a, they are a known dislocator, can still dislocate. And so here you have the femoral head dislocated superiorly. You have two locking rings, both of which are broken. So you notice the gap here, notice the gap here. So both of those locking rings, which are meant to hold, hold this in place, have broken, and that has allowed the head to dislocate out. Both the prosthesis can fracture as well as the host bone. And so here you already have an example of a locking ring. Four years later, you can see that that's broken. And therefore, it's not going to be constraining the head as, as we would like it to be. This is an example of a fracture of the prosthesis itself. You don't see these too often anymore because with the modern stem designs, particularly the non-cemented, what happens is that they're tapered and so you don't get as stiff a prosthesis. The reason the older designs used to break is because you had a stiff piece of metal sitting in a more compliant bone. So the modulus of elasticity between metal and bone is different. The metal is less compliant and it would actually have metal fatigue and break. You don't see that as much anymore with the tapered stem designs. This is a ceramic femoral head and as I mentioned they can break. They don't break as much as they used to in the early 90s. The, the, um, the uh, engineering is much better now but they still can occasionally break and this is what it looks like. So this is the same patient here you can see that the head was sitting symmetrically on the trunnion or the femoral neck. Notice here that the head is no longer symmetric. That means that it is broken. Now the, the ceramic liner can also break. And so here's a patient who was complaining of pain in the hip. The surgeon knew that he had a ceramic on ceramic bearing. You really can't see anything abnormal here um, on the radiograph. And so the patient had a CT the next day, and this is what it looks like. So you can actually see the liner very nicely, and you can see that that's broken. And in a different patient, this is what it would look like when they take the, the uh, prosthesis out. You can see that that liner here is broken. Here's the, the prosthetic ceramic head, but it's the liner that has broken. Now, the other thing that can happen is rather than the prosthesis breaking, the femur can break. And so here are two different examples of periprosthetic fractures. There is a classification that the surgeons use. It's, it's um, very useful. It's the Vancouver classification, and you have three different classes. So you have A, B, and C. A refers to a fracture of either the greater or the lesser trochanter. The B classification refers to fractures around the prosthetic stem. In a B1, you've got a fracture around the prosthetic stem, but you still have um, good bone stock and the prosthesis is well fixed. In a B2, you have a fracture around the stem, but the prosthesis is no longer well fixed, but you still have good bone stock. In a B3, you have a periprosthetic fracture, but now the stem is not well fixed and you also have loss of bone stock. A type C Vancouver fracture means that the fracture occurs distal to the stem. Other complications that you can see are polyethylene wear or breakage. And I show you these two examples. These are older cases. The only reason I'm showing them is because you can actually see very nicely the polyethylene wear in these all polyethylene cups. So you can see that here's the head. It's worn away the cartilage. Here the head, it's worn away the cartilage. We know this because this head should have been sitting symmetrically in the cup, and instead it's now superiorly um, sitting. So here's another patient. This took place over time, and you can see that the head is really markedly superiorly seated. And so what the surgeon will do is they'll just go back in, they'll take out that worn polyethylene, and they'll just put a new liner in. Notice they haven't changed anything else about this, this prosthesis. The stem is the same, the liner is the, the uh, sorry, the cup is the same, that is the shell. All they've done is replace the liner. Now, usually liner wear takes place over time. So if you see asymmetric sitting of the femoral head in the acetabular component and it's taken a quick time course, you have to suspect that that liner has actually either broken or dissociated from the, from the shell itself. So here you had a patient who came in in the middle of March just for a routine checkup, but then they fell a week later at home and they came in complaining of pain and, and a limp and difficulty walking. So just two weeks later, you can now see that that femoral neck is sitting asymmetrically in the liner. That tells you that in the course of two weeks, that liner had to have broken or dislocated or dissociated from the acetabular shell. You can't see it on the radiographs. We took them to CT, and when you do the axial or the sagittal reformat, you can now see that liner very nicely, this lucent polyethylene liner, which has dissociated completely from the acetabular shell.
Now, there are some radiographic um, criteria that we use for either loosening of the stem or the acetabular component. If you have a cemented stem, if you see a lucency that's greater than two millimeters, you should suspect that there's loosening. If you develop a radiolucency or the lucency that's already there widens over time, that would suggest that, it, that, the, uh, that the stem is loose. Or if the cement column is fractured, that suggests that the stem is loose. And so here you have a patient at time zero. This was a normal looking thin radiolucency. That's just fibrous membrane formation that occurred um, due to the exothermic reaction of placing in the cement. That's normal. But notice over time that that has widened and become more irregular. Look here at the tip compared to what it looked like there. That stem is loose. Similarly, you have a patient here now with a fracture through the cement column. But in addition to that fracture at the cement column, look at the change in position of the stem itself. Here it was in neutral to a little bit of valgus. Here it's actually going more into a varus. So we know it's changed in position. That's loose. And in fact, a change in component position or component motion with stress radiography are two more radiographic hallmarks of loosening of the component. So here you have a patient with a femoral component. You can see that the head is sitting asymmetrically within the, in the prosthesis. So you know that there's polyethylene wear. You have these large areas of osteolysis. But look at a picture a year later and notice that the prosthesis has now changed in position. The screw is loose. It's changed in position. All of that tells the surgeon that this component is loose. Similarly, you have another patient here. The stem is is in a neutral position, but you've got wide radiolucency proximally. You've got areas of osteolysis here in the lateral cortex. And eight months later, the actual the stem has actually changed and shifted in position from neutral down the center of the stem into a varus. Any change in position of the component tells you that it is loose. Here's a hip resurfacing. They can also become loose. This was a time zero, and a year later, you can see how that's shifted into position. And in fact, there is a very subtle radiolucency around this peg. Now, when we talk about loosening, there is a differential. Most cases of loosening are just simply mechanical. In other words, over time, that prosthesis through normal usage starts to wear out. But what the surgeon needs to make sure is that there aren't other types of of loosening, there aren't other types of, of um, lucency that are accelerating that, that uh, loosening. So aseptic inflammation, also called particle disease, can cause loosening, and infection can cause loosening. Now, particle disease used to be called cement disease, but we now know that it's a histiocytic response to any of the materials of the prosthesis. So it can be caused by the metal, caused by the cement, or caused by the polyethylene. And actually now, it's actually more common to have the polyethylene uh, cause uh, particle disease. What happens is that histiocytic response gets upregulated um, to, to osteoclastic activity, which then winds up um, eating away at the bone. And these are typically well-defined radiolucencies. So this is taken from uh, the Stryker homepage, and it shows different bearing surfaces. So you can see a metal head against the traditional ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene had the highest wear rate. Um, what happens also is not only is polyethylene the highest wear rate, but it also has the highest inflammatory profile, so it actually causes the most histiocytic response. About 15, 16 years ago, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene was replaced by what's called highly cross-linked polyethylene. It's still polyethylene, but it has a decreased, decreased wear rate. Um, it still has a high inflammatory profile, but you're creating less of those fragments. Metal on metal, as we said, gets rid of the polyethylene completely. It has less shedding than polyethylene. You can have ceramic on polyethylene or ceramic on ceramic. Ceramic on ceramic has the least amount of wear. It also has the lowest inflammatory profile. So here's an example of a patient in 2007. The head is well seated in the cups. This is a metal head on a polyethylene cup. Notice that in 2016, now the same patient has gone on to wearing away of the polyethylene. You can see the asymmetry of the head sitting in the cup. And now they've also developed osteolysis here in the greater trochanter and here in the calcar and the lesser trochanter. Look at these areas compared to what they looked like previously. So this is an example of polyethylene wear with osteolysis. This is a patient with a hip resurfacing. There's no polyethylene, and yet you can see that they've also developed osteolysis 
here in acetabular zone three in the ischium, and the head is actually shifted, the cup is actually shifted superiorly, and you've got all of the sclerosis now as the bone is trying to respond to the shifted position of the cup. Now, osteolysis doesn't have to occur just at the, the joint space. It can occur through screw holes or around the acetabular component. If there aren't any screw holes, this is a, a coronally reformatted CT scan. You can see the screw holes here in the acetabular shell. And you can actually see these large areas of osteolysis, which have occurred because the particles have been allowed by these screw holes to get in and get access to the native acetabulum. And this brings up the concept of the effective joint space. The effective joint space is any site that's reachable by joint fluid. It doesn't have to be at the actual bearing surface itself. And therefore, osteolysis can actually occur at any sites away from the actual articulating surfaces. And so here you have an example of this patient in January 2006. You have a cemented stem. It's a metal femoral head on a polyethylene bearing. And now, two years later, January 2008, look at these large areas of osteolysis. Clearly, this is not a bearing surface. The bearing surface is here. But this is an effective joint space where what's happened is that just by walking, the joint fluid containing all those histiocytic upregulated osteoclasts are now eating away at the cement and the uh, native femur. So in conclusion, radiographs should always be the first imaging modality used to evaluate the prosthetic hip, and then you will supplement that with other imaging modalities as needed. Thank you very much.